Hi everyone, it's Mike Pohaitu here. Uh, today I wanted to quickly run through some of the new option linking features uh, in TSGUI 1.0 and also the conditional logic um, as well. And the two often go hand in hand. Um, so before we get too um, carried away, I just want to quickly run through some terminology things. Uh, when I'm talking about the source option, what I'm talking about is the option that when you interact with it, affects the value of another option, which would then be the target. So in this case, when I interact with this option, labeled source, it affects the targets over here. Um, pretty obvious, but just thought I should make that clear. Now, when you're configuring a source, every source um, or every option that you want to be a source, you need to give it an ID. And this ID needs to be unique within the config. Otherwise, um, it'll throw an error, basically. Um, and that's um, what you use to identify the option in your queries elsewhere in your config. So also always just make sure that that ID is set, that it's unique um, and relatively descriptive. I've also updated the live data window to list the ID so it's clear as to which things um, are interacting with what other bits. So the other thing I'm going to quickly do as well is just run through some of the um, what I call shorthand options inside of the config. Now there's three options here and I've actually commented them to say they're shorthand um, and they're fairly clear according to the um, comments here, but I'll just quickly show you what they look like in practice if you haven't done so yourself already. Uh, the three shorthand ones are link to, link true, and link false. So the link to one, any time that the source changes, the target will update itself to match the source. Pretty straightforward. Um, what I'll do later on is show you how you can potentially use that in other scenarios other than just the checkbox. But all three of these particular options really were um, designed with the checkbox in mind. And they're really around things like application lists for options that say select all slash unselect all. Um, so you can just tick a whole group of applications rather than having to go through one, um, one at a time. So the link true. Um, the way this one works, any time that the source changes to a value of true, the target will also get set to true. But if it changes to any other value, for example false, nothing happens. And the link false query type down here, that's the inverse. So if your target is checked and you change your source to unchecked, well sorry, if you change um, your source to false, your target will also get set to false, or the value of the target will also get set to false. Um, but when it gets changed to true, again, nothing happens. So these two are inverses of each other, basically. So that might be useful, say, if you were going to have a tick box for select all, um, but when you uncheck the same box, it didn't unselect everything again, as an example. So those are the shorthand options, and those can actually be built using other queries. They're just obviously a, a much bigger piece of config. Um, but if you want to fine tune them and do slightly different things, then obviously you can do that. So that's the shorthand. Um, what we'll do from here is we'll run through a few of the queries um, and how they interact with each other, and also um, how things get updated and when they get updated, just so things are kind of clear. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to scroll down to here. Now this checkbox here is for this little line here. And this is our first look at a piece of conditional logic. Now conditional logic is all done using this if else query or query this if else query type. Um, and they're relatively self-explanatory um, the way it kind of gets structured if this source query matches this rule set 
set the result to this. Now inside of the source and the query, sorry, in the source and the result is the values for these things get set by queries. This value here under the hood is actually a query. It just always returns the same thing. So when I'm talking about queries, uh, the value is actually a query. So just keep that in mind. So what you can do here is you can create a query. Now this query could be a WMI query if you wanted it to be. It could be environment variable. In this case, we're using an option value query. And this is what we're using to do the option linking. So when we query the option value, what we're doing is if the source equals player, we'll basically get the value of the source with this ID. From there, we're processing it through a rule set, and I'll cover that in more detail in a minute. And then from there, we set a result. And again, the result could potentially be another um, WMI query or environment variable or option value. So it could be the case of if this um, ID, say, starts with test, then set the result to the value of another option value if you wanted to. So you can use these queries to do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, the other thing I'll mention as well is uh, if you've had a look at the query videos um, before, you can do things like um, append data or um, prefix data, do truncations, do some maths on things. Um, so this could be useful, for example, if you had an option value that's returning the memory in, say, kilobytes. You may get that option value and then you may do some maths on it and then use that return the result of that in your rule set. So have a look at the query uh, video just to see how the queries get structured. Basically what comes out of that query is the thing that's going to get passed into the rule set. And again down here um, again, you can take the result, potentially query another option value, maybe prefix some data, um, append some, a bit of extra text, do a bit of maths on it, whatever you need to do. Now, the other thing I'll mention about the queries is when they get updated. So when you do an option value query, any time that this ID changes, it fires off an event that goes through the rest of the system. When that event gets fired, it's going to come through and reprocess this query. So it's generally not a problem from a performance point of view, um, but just keep that in mind as to what the behavior is. It's not going to say when this changes, it's not going to like start from halfway through or anything like that. It's going to start from the top and reprocess the whole thing. Now, the side effect of that is, so if you're doing, working on a text field, so if I type in this at the end, it's going to fire an event for T, for H, for I, and for S. Now, if you had your query, or one of your queries was a WMI query, that's you know going to start hammering WMI, which is not really desirable. So when you have a WMI query, that gets queried once and then gets stored um, in, inside the system rather than reprocessing every time. So that value will stay. So don't worry about it sort of hammering WMI, it just won't do that. For option values, um, yeah, it's not a problem because you're querying inside the system, it's nice and fast, so not a problem. So moving on to the rule sets. Uh, now again, these rule sets are pretty much identical to what you'd be used to in validation and compliance options. You've got your rules of your various types, start with, uh, starts with, contains, etc. Um, so if you want a bit more detail on those particular rules and the various rule types, have a look at the validation and compliance example configs. 
Um, you can also have a look at those videos for a bit more details on those as well. Couple, the one thing I will mention about the rule sets is that you can now have an and, or, and or uh, rule set, and you can also nest them. So this rule set is this: the result of this query has to start with test, and it has to contain the number 12. And when that happens, that thing will get ticked. So if I start with test, oh, I've got a space in there, so that's not going to work. And then I put one, two somewhere, that gets ticked. Now, if I was to change that to an OR, so if we just put 12 anywhere, that will work. That says has to start with test or it contains 12. Now where it gets interesting is that you can now also nest these. So let's do and and then we can have a second rule set that says or uh, let's change that to an ends with or it contains X, Y, Z. So this now says if it starts with test and it contains the number 12 and it ends with A or contains X, Y, Z. So let's have a look at that. So it has to start with test And it has to contain a 12 and then it needs to end with A or it contains X, Y, Z. So there you can have a nested, basically think of it like a, an and or condition using your brackets. and that can take whatever structure you need to. So rule set within a rule set within you, you could have another rule set if you really wanted to. Now you can have multiple if functions, so it's a case of if this one doesn't match, then it will go on to the next if. And if all of those fail, then there's an else. If you don't have an else, then it will just fail through and not update anything. But if you have an else, then it will change the value to whatever you set in here, whether it's a query or um, or value. So that's conditional logic um, in a nutshell. Probably a very large nutshell, um, but a nutshell nonetheless. So from using the conditional logic, using the if else query type, um, and we've, all, we've also, in the process of doing that, also covered the option value query type. You can go through and start tweaking things according to how you want. And that may be a case of using some of the no UI options. So you, you could have a, a value that's not even stored or not even displayed in your GUI affecting other options if you really wanted to. Um, Obviously be a little bit careful about that, um, make sure it's actually intuitive for the user. Um, but you could, for example, have uh, a prime example actually, is if you have the hardware eval option set, which I actually haven't. So let's add that in. So this will do you things like um, TSGUI underscore is laptop. 
So these by default will get their ID set to the same as the variables. So if you want to use those inside the config, you can. So from there you could have logic that says, if this machine is a laptop, set your value to this. Or whatever you need it to be. Just be aware, as you can see here, if you've got a virtual machine running on a desktop or on a laptop, you can actually get both values. And that's because it's um, the laptop is pulling the chassis type, which can come through to the virtual machine still. So often it's a good idea to start your uh, if else query list, have the if tsgui underscore is virtual machine equals true query um, at the top if you want that to be, if you want to be checking for virtual machines and then go through to the hardware types um, because you, as, a, as you can see, you can get both. So from there, it's um, pretty self-explanatory beyond that. Um, you can use the set value on pretty much any uh, GUI option type. You can use it on drop-down lists. Um, so if you do a set value, just make sure the result matches one of these active values. Um, and then it will go through and update uh, the drop-down list to the selected value. Also make note of, these are the, some of the things I was talking about before with your query types. You bring in the ID, in this case the name over here, and then you may append um, something to the end of it. So for example, you could have, rather than having a computer name field, you might have a free text field that in, you enter in the asset tag. And then if the uh, machine is a laptop or a desktop, you may... Um, prefix it with some sort of identifier to identify it as a laptop or a desktop, followed by the asset tag, and maybe that's your computer name. So with these sorts of um, combinations, you can kind of do what you really need it to do and start enforcing some naming standards to make sure things get done properly. So hopefully that covers everything you need to know about um, option linking and conditional logic. Uh, if you have any questions, issues, bug reports, etc., as usual, please get in touch via the 20road.com website. Thanks very much.